Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now then, so we have much to discuss. It is a Heineken Champions Cup weekend ahead, very much an Anglo-Irish affair. Also, David Nusifora has been speaking to uh, sections of the Irish media this afternoon and it's all been uh, published in various formats. To discuss, we have a novel pairing this evening. Ben Coles of The Telegraph, hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us, Ben. It's your job to bring us up to speed on where all the English teams are. We'll come to that in a second. And also we have Darren still getting used to former Ulster player Cave with us. Hello, Darren Cave. Hi, uh, how are you, Joe? Very well, very well, very well. So we'll get on to Heineken Champions Cup in just a moment if you bear with us, Ben, and, and maybe you might enjoy us navel-gazing and still picking away at the scab of uh, the World Cup 2019. But David Nusifor, the IRFU Performance Director, has been speaking with journalists today. They have conducted a review, the RFU, into, well, ultimately, I suppose, what went wrong at the World Cup. Darren, I know you've had a, a quick look at some of the reports. They've pinpointed a few things. The, a failure to develop a style of play, a lack of focus maybe on Japan, or certainly really focusing in Scotland and, and taking Japan uh, for granted to whatever extent you want to um, go with. Uh, psychological shortcomings and, and, and not performing under pressure and then the one that always comes up after every World Cup anyway which is the need to further develop Irish players skill sets so I think the first uh, two in particular might be the ones which I don't know might irk Joe Schmidt or, or look the most damning one a failure to develop style of play and two a lack of focus on Japan those are the two that jump out to me yeah and it is a very very hard thing to dissect. I mean, you and I have spoken about it before. Ireland have been so disappointing for the majority of 2019, and uh, it is really hard to put your finger on the exact cause for it. One thing I do agree with strongly is that it, it is a combination of a number of things because there is a flaw in every argument because, um, you know, the Japan, we didn't play well against Japan, but you're you I'm the clock. We've been, you know, we've been out of form for a while. So, you know, psychologically, did we struggle in 2019 with being close to best, the best team in the world, if not the best team in the world at times? Perhaps our style of play, I do think we struggled to cope with teams that were very physical, and I do think we didn't adapt our style of play, but at the same time, it was still the same style of play that led us to a reasonably convincing uh, victory against the All Blacks. So... <laughs> I, I don't overly disagree with anything that's um, that's been said. I just am happy it's not my job to be trying to sift through the the, the embers. What David Nusifora said exactly on the style of play situation, I'm sure people are curious. Uh, should we have developed our game further? Potentially, yes. But I say that with the benefit of hindsight. And our coaches have been good at those things for a long period of time. We could have gone down that path, but there was no guarantee that would have got us a better result. It creates a risk. We chose the path of let's stick with what we do and just try and get an extra 10 or 15%. Should we have armed our players with more tools? In hindsight, we should have. But that's easy for me to say sitting here now. It potentially could have really turned to custard for us. It's a learning for us in terms of managing the future. It'd be interesting to know, we never quite will, is that is that um, sense of things coming from the players who might have contributed or from Joe Schmidt, who obviously would have contributed as well? It's also um, not entirely clear. Well, I haven't looked at the uh, report in depth, mm. um, but that is something that was of interest to me. It does say it was, it was sort of all done by outside consultants, but I wonder... Um, who exactly is giving this feedback? Mm. Uh, not that it's wrong. I said it's just a, something of note um, because obviously that's that's a pretty important thing. And uh, I suppose, as I said before, there's a hole in every argument. And I, mm. I thought, I think back to the Scotland game in the World Cup. And granted, Scotland had a poor World Cup, but I thought that performance from Ireland and that victory was very typical of where the success. Um, that the Irish team have had over the past number of years. Very solid defence, um, very strong kicking game, putting teams under pressure, and then when they force the game, just really pouncing on that. So uh, it is just such a hard thing to, to fully dissect. I'm, I'm not fully convinced, but I do understand the argument. You know, when Japan were throwing the ball around and New Zealand were doing the same mm -hmm. and we were sticking to our reasonably conservative game plan, which has served us very, very well, we did look um, we did look average at times. Yeah. One last point, and we'll finish in this. What he said, David Nusifor, on the Japan situation in particular, was our coaching approach during the time 
in the lead-in was to focus on the Scotland game and everything focused on it. That was perceived to be the biggest game of the group. He went on to say later on, we underestimated the level of intensity Japan could produce for 80 minutes. It genuinely surprised us. We feel we got a few things wrong there and feel if we had our time again, we would have been uh, split more between the two teams. Ben, you might give us the outside of view as we uh, leave the World Cup behind because we have talked about it a lot here, as you might imagine. When you looked at Ireland in 2019, it all just felt a bit flat to us. What were you seeing or thinking? Uh, there was definitely a sense that maybe the peak had already happened um, a, a year before, I think, as, as the Six Nations sort of played out and as they built towards Japan. I, yeah, something felt a little off, um, but in various areas. And I guess... As Darren said, when those sort of areas all sort of add up, and you're you're not quite firing all cylinders in your in your physicality, in your execution, in your in your defence, that then that turns into a bigger issue. And and so I think that was I think that was probably quite clear as as the year were on, and certainly by the end of that Six Nations and the Wales game, that that things just weren't the same as they were yeah. a few months beforehand, and that therefore that's very hard to to turn around and, and for all the success of 2018 it, it's so it must be quite a frustrating feeling if your players and coaching staff to realise that perhaps you have peaked too soon and, and a year out from the World Cup I think that's going to be one of the things that, that will certainly stay with those players and with Joe Schmidt too Ben as we segue into the action at the weekend be interested just to get your thoughts on the status of the actual competition at the moment the Heineken Champions Cup it's been notable in the last uh, couple of days or weeks certainly Simon Halliday was saying to the Sunday Times, everything is in the mix. We've, and he was talking here about the format of the competition. We've created a roundtable debate going on all year to ask what's wrong with the status quo? Should we look at more teams, fewer teams? Home and away quarterfinals? Everything gets thrown on the table. Uh, there is a, probably a sense over here that the uh, tinkering with the competition a couple of years ago uh, didn't really help things and uh, just took a bit of, a bit of something away from it and, and you know splitting it between BT Sport and Sky Sports and all these kind of things. Uh, I think people probably get equally uh, a little bit unsure when Simon Halliday is talking about looking at the format again. I mean, maybe home and away quarterfinals could be quite exciting in fairness. What, do you, what are you hearing? Is this very genuine? Are they going to start moving with tinkering with the format again? You'd sort of be surprised if they were thinking down that line given we're still still feels like we're betting in mm. to a new format that we're sort of that we're trying to get accustomed to that process and home and away quarterfinals uh it does sound interesting to a point and t until you think that today we're we're celebrating in a way the fact that the Lions tour is two less games but over the same period of time and how good that is for player welfare mm. so to then add in an extra an extra element to the quarterfinals of the champions cup would seem would seem to work against that mm. i i i think we have, a, I think, when we decided to trim the competition down to the 20 teams, the whole idea was that would breed um, uh, more of an elite tournament. And I think we do have that. I, I think we do see tougher contests and tighter games and, and less mismatches. And, and that's really what everybody wanted in the first place. So I'd, I'd be surprised. The idea that everything is in the mix is, is fairly, fairly eyebrow raising because it's still quite a young tournament in this format, really. Mm. The other thing, if we uh, stay with the format conversation for one other question, is what might happen in terms of a British-Irish league. So there's been talk about this as well, given that CVC Capital Partners are obviously invested in the Premiership now and also the Pro 14 as well. There has been talk of some kind of amalgamation over the last couple of days, the 14 English clubs and the 10 sides from Ireland, Scotland, Wales from 2022 onwards. Now, I think Irish provinces would jump at that, to be honest. Uh, the Scottish problems, you know, Glasgow in decline, uh, the Welsh region's in crisis, Italy like doing what they can, but really the Pro 14 lacks a bit of uh, competition, frankly. We, the English clubs, would they look at this and run a mile or, or what's the sense over there? I, I think the sense has always been uh, that the English game and the English league is a very strong product in its own right and, and that therefore there isn't as much of a need to sort of merge with with teams from other countries because the league has has consistently developed and, and produced an entertaining product over the years. Whether it's been the battle at the top or or the battle to avoid relegation at the bottom, I, I think actually that relegation battle 
uh, sort of can get overlooked sometimes. Actually, that's such an exciting element to the season, particularly this season, where everything has been flipped on its head, and you have the sides sort of trying to claw their claw their way back from a points deduction. And Saracens, that, that, we'll get onto them, and they're obviously they're not going to get relegated. But there's so much intrigue there and storyline there that I think the Premiership, Premiership rugby feel they have a very strong product and and that they don't really need to to look at merging. I can 100% see why the Welsh regions would would want to and and how much of a lifeline that would be to to create that sort of product if it was on the table. But I don't I don't think the same enthusiasm is here for that at the moment. Okay, I didn't expect it to be any other way to be honest. Let's look at the action at the weekend then. So, Darren, let's start with Ulster, who have Harlequins at uh, Kingspan Stadium, 3.15 on Saturday. This, because of the first two weeks, has become such a brilliant opportunity for Ulster. So if Ulster can win these two games, that takes them to a minimum of, of 16 points. And then they beat Bath at home, and that would get them to 20 very easily and very quickly, and suddenly they'd be in fantastic shape. So they've set themselves up. They have taken, and you were on the pitch obviously, taken the momentum they might have drawn from an ultimately disappointing day but a very good performance against Leinster in the quarter-final last year and seem to have hit the ground running this year. Yeah, and the big advantage Ulster have um, is when you, the when the group it was done and you see that there's the, the two English teams and obviously that's not something that would normally get you that excited but to, to go back slightly, the reason I think the, the British and Irish League might appeal to the English teams is because it will make the Champions Cup a far more of a level playing field. If you look at Ulster's fixture last week, and this is something I was aware of when I was playing, but the gap now between the Pro 14 and the Premiership has, I think, doubled in, in the past couple of years. Ulster last week were at home with the Scarlets on a Friday night. The Scarlets had um, a large number of players playing in an exhibition match the next day against um, <clears throat> against the Barbarians. Mm. Um, you know, Billy Burns didn't play, Jordy Murphy didn't play, Ian Henderson played, Jacob Stock didn't play, Marcia, Marcel Coutsia went off at halftime, mm. John Cooney went off just after halftime. These are Ulster's best players, and this is our preparation going into this Harlequins game. Now, you look at Harlequins and Bath, sitting eighth and ninth in that table, suddenly their focus is starting to move away from this Champions Cup already because they're in the middle of, um, you know, scrambling to get back in next year and, most importantly, staying away from relegation. Not only that, Harlequin's tough game against Gloucester on, on, I think it was Sunday. So if you look right across the fixtures in these Champions Cup games and look at who's playing um, who, who's playing who in the previous games, again, to mention Gloucester, they're playing Harlequin's on a Sunday. And the, the Connor are having pretty much a captain's practice at home to the Southern Kings the week before. So there's not a level playing field. And mm. because of that, Ulster will be very, very confident. Ulster will not fear. They'll think that they can topple Harlequins this week, that Harlequins will sort of make a few changes for next week, start worrying about the Christmas Premiership fixtures because they need results there. Then Bath will come to, to the Kingsman in January and get absolutely massacred because they'll be in the same mindset and then we'll go to Claremont and get a losing bonus point. So also will be very, I hope that doesn't sound too bullish, but they will be very confident about the position they're in. No, it makes sense. I mean, there's a real logic there and, and English clubs have made the point in the past, the difference in demands between the Pro 14 and the Premiership. I mean, we can't ignore it. It's interesting you think that has increased, that gap has increased over the last couple of years. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's because I've left the game or and I've noticed it. I, I also think if you look at the Premiership, um, you've seen the likes of London Irish come up and, OK, the, we're, we're only five games into the season, but they're in the top half of the Premiership. Uh, Bristol have done what they've done. Worcester have come up and looked pretty settled. Um, so the, the worst teams in the Premiership are all teams now. I mean, looking at the league table now, the... The four bottom teams, Bath, Was, Leicester and Saracens, I'm pretty sure they've all won a Premiership before. Um, teams like Sale, um, who have been have been weak for the last few years, are up in fifth. Uh, and obviously Exeter have done what they've done over the past 10 years. So I, I just think the... Um, I don't think the best teams in the English Premiership are any better than the best teams in the Pro 14. But I think the gap between the bottom teams is very, very significant. And the, the result is the top teams in the Pro 14 have much easier um, mm. league weeks going into cup games. Also, 
to concentrate on the Irish provinces. You'd expect all four Irish provinces to finish in the top six and get into the playoffs. Um, you know, so there's no real worry about relegation. Mm. Um, whereas that the English Premiership is just a complete different beast. And as I said, if Harlequins lose this weekend at um, at the Kingspan, they'll be uh, they'll be thinking, you know what? Let's worry, let's forget about Europe and let's make sure we we look after our meat and drink. Bath are playing back to back against Claremont, and they'll be thinking the exact same thing. Mm. So it's um, I feel like the gap's got bigger, definitely. Right, there is a, a touch of incentive, incentive maybe for Harlequins. Billy Burns is an injury concern. Will Addison is out obviously for the next uh, four weeks with his suspension, but. They are eighth in the Premiership, Ben. What kind of shape do Harlequins pitch up to Belfast in? I think given a bit of a boost after that win over Gloucester, um, quite a big boost actually, given that given the way they've started the season. Um, I think they've won three out of the seven games they've played so far. It's not everything sort of went well last last time out, and everyone was on a bit of a high because Paul Gustav came in and, and made sweeping changes, and, and they needed a jolt really. Um, after the end of the John Kingston era, and he delivered that. Um, second seasons, I always think, are fascinating because you either see certain teams where the ethos of the coach is sort of bedding in and they go to a new level, thinking Northampton, for example, mm. who are top of the table, Ulster under Dan McFarlane spring to mind as well, um, Patrice Collazzo at Toulon, at Toulon, where teams are improving because they've had extra time with these systems and it's, and it's getting better. With Quinns, I just wonder, because they had such a breakout campaign last time, mm. whether they're going to find it a little bit tougher and whether, whether other teams will have, be a bit smarter to what they're trying to do there. They, they've still got some outstanding talents there, and, and, and Alex Dombrandt in particular, is his name is being muttered as one of those post-World Cup um, additions to England's squad moving forward. Um, and, and he's obviously a very exciting player that they can build around. So uh, it, it will be interesting to see sort of how they fare just over the next month. I think we'll sort of find out a lot about them in this in this December period because it's gonna it really will make or break their season how they fare in Europe and in the league. Darren, just before we leave uh, Ulster, you might give us a bit of an insight into John Cooney and his personality and how he's managed really just to continue the brilliant form, not least in Europe and on the big occasions. He's like a kind of French number nine running the game and and, and Billy Burns seems quite happy for him to do that in, in places as well. So the way he's really stepped into kind of an impossible uh, vacuum after Ruin Pienaar's departure. Yeah, he's had a, he's been playing good rugby for Ulster for a couple of years, as yeah. anyone as everyone knows. But I do feel like um, he's raised it um, a little bit again this year. The way Ulster play, he's incredibly important. Billy Burns hasn't played as much rugby as Ulster would have liked. And as you mentioned, he's an injury doctor this week. If he doesn't play, then his role becomes even bigger because of the strength of his kicking game. Mm. And it will be interesting to see from an international point of view. I think um, going forward, number nine is probably Ireland's hottest sort of jersey. If you think through Luke McGrath, Marmion, Jameson Gibson Parks, Irish now or soon mm. qualifies, um, Connor Murray and John Cooney. So it is incredibly... Um, competitive, but I just feel like there will be Andy Farrell will put a couple of stamps on this Ireland team. And even though John Cooney, you know, he's, he's slightly older, it's not like he's a young kid. The standard he's been playing to, um, you know, I certainly think he's one with them with the chance of just coming from nowhere from an international point of view uh, over the next few months. And his importance to this Ulster team mm. is absolutely massive. And tell us about Dan McFarland working with him day to day. I, I, we spoke briefly before and you made the point that he is a very detail-oriented coach. I mean, broadly speaking, kind of out of the school of Joe Schmidt. Yeah, you can, so he's definitely, um, you know, been in Ireland camp when Joe's been in charge because uh, he, he references certain phrases that Joe would use. And I definitely think he styles his preparation and his coaching on Joe. And he's intelligent enough to know that Joe is the most successful rugby coach in the history of professional rugby in Ireland so he's a pretty good person to learn from so he's meticulous in his in his in his preparation in his detail and he's done a great job uh, at Ulster I think he's given the team a real identity in terms of how they want to play they like to win the ball in the air and kick box kick off nine like all Irish teams do but at the same time they recognize that if the game is an arm wrestle um, that they're going to struggle so they need to move the ball as well 
this year their defence has been particularly strong and we haven't seen the best of their attack. Last week against the Scarlets, it was slightly better. So hopefully that is the first step um, on that journey and we'll see more of that this weekend. Yeah, OK. And Jared Payne's role there has been talked about as well. He's getting plenty of um, compliments over the last couple of weeks in particular. If we move to Franklin's Garden then, Chris Boyd, you mentioned second um, season, Ben. It's in, you, know, you, you drew that parallel. So Chris Boyd, the New Zealanders, his second year in charge and Northampton are flying at the top of the Premiership. Uh, both Northampton and Leinster on nine points. Dan Bigger got them out of a bit of a hole, Treviso away last day out, and they beat Leon as well. So they're un- unbeaten this season, and this is just kind of one of those uh, European games that has a bit of history as well and a certain heritage. Uh, Leinster's record is very good there, 1-13 and 13 and 17, and obviously there's memories of the final in 11. So it's all really nicely set up there. Can you tell us a bit about Chris Boyd, the impression he's making, the kind of rugby he has Northampton playing now in their second season with him? Yeah, I think the maybe the biggest compliment I could pay them is um, it's a bit like watching the Hurricanes during his title winning season back in 2016 where the the way the speed of their recycling has been outstanding they're a very solid defensive team but but so much of the good work that they, good work that they do is orientated around the line out and around the attacking game there's a I mean there's a good reason why. Sam Vesti's name has been heavily linked with the England coaching setup over the last couple of weeks, and that's because his work as attack, attack coach there, working with Chris Boyd, has been really impressive. Um, to Kelly Nayarivora has been unplayable the last few weeks in the league, and and the fact that you've got him on one wing, and then some young talents like Rory Hutchinson and Tom Collins uh, and George Furbank at fullback. These are all young players who who Boyd is getting the best out of. It, it helps that you have. An international halfback pairing, and, and you mentioned Dan Bigger sort of getting the win at Benetton. That was that was an outstanding bit of bit of kicking under pressure. But also, Kovis mm-hmm. Ranick has come back, and it's like he fairly left off. He was one of the best players in England last season, and and that form has continued really. Um, Boyd himself is is quite a is an entertaining character. Uh, your your classic sort of Kiwi coach wearing shorts in December kind of guy. Sort of just gets on with gets on with it, no frills. Um, but the work he's done to turn Northampton around, I mean, it, it, it's not that long ago that we were we were watching them in, in tatters, really, when Jim Mallinder left the club after so many years and, and everything needed a massive shake-up. And, and now here we are with them top of the table, admittedly quite early into the season, but they're playing and attacking around the rugby mm-hmm. and they also have the, the skills there to shut down games and, and to win tight matches, I think. So how difficult will this be for Leinster going there, Ben? How, how do you see this game going? Well, it, it'll be a lot tougher than 17, for example, mm. when when those two matches took place. I think that was, I think it's fair to say that that was Northampton's low, um, low point, and and the, it's almost night and day compared to where they were then to where they are now. Um, I guess Leinster will live to try and squeeze them in the set piece and to limit that sort of that ball out wide that Northampton have been craving this season. But if they do get on the front foot and, and Reinach is getting quick rock ball and able to feed his backs, then it, Matt Proctor has been a great addition at centre as well. He worked with Boyd at the Hurricanes. Um, then they can cause Leinster problems because they have done it in the league so far this season. They've comfortably beaten the most defenders. Mm. Things like 62 to Bristol's 50 and they've scored 20 tries already, mm. which is five better than anybody else. So they're, they're an attacking tour de force at the moment. It's different in the Champions Cup, but but they are a threat this time, far more than two years ago. OK. What about this one then, Darren? Leinster post-World Cup have got back to business pretty comfortably and quickly, to be honest. Definitely looks like the... Uh the fixture of the round to be honest with you Leinster have looked absolutely unstoppable in both competitions so far I think they're um, seven from seven is it overall Mm. they've scored um, might even be more than that I think they've scored 30 plus points six odd times but Northampton of the of the teams I've seen in the Premiership uh, I've been very very impressed with them Uh, actually big picture in terms of what they're building they haven't just um signed big names and spent big money and broken salary caps, not that anybody in the Premiership would do that but um, they have a lot of young guys coming through and they've been really, really impressive and obviously um, they're they're at home as well so really, really tough one to call. I see them both probably getting 
out of the group. Although Benetton are there on merit and not as a token Italian team, I think they will struggle as the as the the Champions Cup continues. Leon, I, I could see um, you know them sort of wavering come January time. So I expect these two to to come out of the 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 pool. And it's such a hard game to call because I just cannot see how you can beat Leinster if they play well. Mm. But um, I'm looking forward to seeing them um, really, really tested against a really impressive Northampton team. So uh, I'm just going to sit on the fence, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Enjoy it there. Uh, so that's uh, Frank, that's <laughs> on uh, Saturday, 1 o'clock. And then I guess maybe competition for tie the round. If Mark McCall keeps his pledge, Ben, to name a strong side, we'll know on midday, sometime around midday on Friday, Munster Saracens, 5.35 on Saturday, under the lights of Thomond. Munster obviously drew their last game at home, so they're on the back foot a touch in this pool and need a big result here. And then Saracens rock up, and well, you can tell us <laughs> the general mood. I mean, the everyone hates us and we don't care vibe. There's an extra layer on that this year, that's for sure. Yeah, there certainly is. And, and you know, you can tell that they just love it as well. And, and that it's just such an easy message to sort of feed into their players and, and to, to motivate them every week. Um, I, the... This is a fascinating game because obviously if this doesn't go well at Tottenham Park, then I sort of think that's it for their campaign because I, I think they, from there they'll just think, is, is it really worth us putting full resources into the Champions Cup this season when admittedly they are they are going to stay up in the Premiership. I don't think that's beyond doubt. But the way the table is shaping up um, and, and the way certain teams are, are splattering at the moment, it's not really impossible to suggest that Saracens can win loads of games and end up near the top six and be challenging for that six spot. I mean, mm. they are obviously a long way back, but we're only a few rounds into the season and, and there's so much to play for. Um, and Mark McCall has to manage his England players. So say they do lose a Munster, is he then going? He's not going to want to use those players in matches when he can in Champions Cup matches when qualification is tricky when he can potentially save them. Yeah. Um, so, it, so it's fascinating. I, I think they, they love weeks like this. They, they, lo- they will love the challenge of going over there. They will love the challenge of, of facing Munster. They'll love the fact that um, everybody's sort of against them, uh, that, that it will be an interesting, tasty atmosphere. I think that will tickle their boxes. And they're tended to thrive in those games. Mm. Um, when the big lads are back for the Bath game on Friday, Farrell, uh, both in the Polars this time, Mario Toje. They look back to that mechanical best where they just suck in defences and suck in de- and create overlaps and spaces and, and score tries and keep the scoreboard ticking. And they can be so ruthless when they play like that. Yeah, and Darren, they're damn hard to break down as well. I mean, the defence is just so mean and there's no space. And uh, Munster and Stephen Larkin, it'll be a real test of their medal and see, see how much work they've managed to do. And Munster, as I mentioned, are on the back foot a little bit in this pool after dropping points at home last day out. So Munster against Saracens. Like, Saris have beaten them very comfortably on the last three occasions. Yeah, and you never, ever write Saracens off. And uh, I would definitely agree with Ben. They, have a, they seem to have a real siege mentality there. I think all good sports teams do, but them in particular, the more you write them off, uh, the more you hate them, the more you think and the more you call them cheaters and tell them their medals should be taken off them, it just builds something. And I was unfortunate to play against them four times in, in Europe and lost all four. And I used to hate playing against them. Absolutely hate it. Uh, so never ever write them off mm. and uh, I am fascinated by them this year because again I agree with Ben I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up in the top six I think there's absolutely no chance they will get relegated I think when you set you know you've set the bar to them to go and get you know a gross sort of 80 points um, they are capable of going and getting it now obviously you take into consideration a lot of their players are off the back of a hugely draining and successful World Cup and they're they're going to have to go again for a Six Nations it will be tough um, but they are capable mm. uh, what having was, said what, that Munster yeah, Golden Park in Europe yeah. um, you don't write them off either so I'm still on the fence oh you're still um, there so. good yeah okay don't move off it yeah. stay on it <laughs> no um, you never will never what, will what, what um, made it so miserable playing against Saracens on those occasions Darren? Um, just how uh, sort of stingy a team they were, and um, the, the the energy with which they used to 
uh, get off the line and defence and chase kicks and it really is smothering. Um, when I was playing, I loved teams that used the classic sort of drift defence. They they give you time, mm-hmm. try to push you towards the sideline. And uh, the way I played, I just used to love when teams said, look, give you time on the ball. And the more time I had, the more likely I was to make a good decision and the more comfortable I felt. And um, the more, you know, at stages in my career, I was able to get the ball into the likes of Tommy Bow and Andrew Trimble's hands with, with time and in space. And when you're against Saracens, it's a complete different gravy. It was 80 minutes of an absolute war of people sprinting at you. And they give you absolutely nothing. Uh, and then they punish you when you make any mistake. So, it's, as I said, it's going to be a cracking game. But I'm actually going to slide off the fence and I'm going to back Munster. Okay. Just by dint of Thomond and heritage and tradition and all those kind of things. Exactly, exactly, and I have to. I can't come on here and, and you know and not back uh, back the fellow Irish team. So I'm going to back Munster. You can do what you want. We're talking here with uh, Ben Coles of the Telegraph and Darren Cave. Just very finally, then Connacht in uh, King's home. So Connacht was started reasonably well. They won at home against Montpellier, which was a huge win, and then they lost in Toulouse. People might remember Munster fans in particular might remember last year. Gloucester came to the home and that was the day Danny Cipriani was sent off, slightly unlucky, but under the new rules he had to go. And then Joey Carberry put in a bit of a masterclass in uh, King's home. Connacht don't have a great record against Gloucester. What's going to happen here, Ben? Uh, well, Gloucester are in a bit of a funny place because they've lost their last five in a row. Mm-hmm. Um, and having started the season well, it, you sort of wonder sort of wonder when they're going to snap out of this losing streak. It, it looked as though when they went ahead at Harlequins last weekend that that might be it, especially with the fact that Frank Frank Mosto is back, and um, I think that they're, they're just facing a couple of issues across different areas. And one has been the scrum. The scrum hasn't been that outstanding uh, this season. There's definitely been some. There's been some issues there. It's slightly better against Harlequins, but they're not quite firing up front. And obviously, that's always a worry when you're going on going on the road, especially to Ireland in the Champions Cup. Um, it, it's not a massive surprise to see that they've been linked with someone like Carl Sinker on a big money contract because they do lack a, a, a world class tight head and he would fit the bill. Um, and also leadership. I, I think they're really missing Willie Hines with the injury that he picked up during the World Cup. I think they're, they're just lacking that direction. Danny Cipriani is not quite firing as well as he was. Um, so there's there's little elements like that where they would, they were sort of the, the critics' favourite team last year in the Premiership because they were doing so many things well and they were. They were upsetting the established order a little bit and playing exciting rugby. This season, something's just not quite there yet. So, which makes going over to Connell very tough because yeah. the sports grounds a merciless place to go if you're if you're slightly off your game and your confidence is wavering. Yeah, okay. And Connacht are playing well, so they might fancy that. Right, that has been our rugby coverage. With thanks to uh, Vodafone hashtag uh, Team of Us, everyone in. So, just to round things off. Ben and Darren, just give me your, your, your predictions. So back to Tom and Darren, you went Munster. What are you saying, Ben, for Tom and Park? Uh, that's a tough one. I I would probably go with Munster as well for this one. Okay. Then Ulster, are you going for Ulster at, at uh, Kingspan? I presume you are, Darren. Yeah, I have to. Okay. Ben? Yes, I think so as well. Okay. Leinster, Northampton, Ben? I think Saints will win that one. I think it would be a massive win for them. Yeah, a bit of a statement win. Okay. Darren? Um, yeah, I'm going to back Northampton as well. I think Leinster can afford to lose it and regroup and still come back. And I think they'll still come back and win the group. Okay. And are we sent, Are we there? Are we both going for Connacht? Yes, I, I, I think, think so. <laughs> I'm going to go for Gloucester. I just think they've... I know they've, they've, they're on a bad run, but I just think there's too much quality. I don't know. Okay, well, that's excellent. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why you asked me to come on the show, isn't it? Yeah. You're allowed to say you don't know. It's perfectly fine. Uh, listen, thanks very much, fellas. Big Anglo-Irish weekend always has a kind of certain flavour in uh, the Heineken Champions Cup, so enjoy it. Ben Coles of The Telegraph. Thanks, Ben. Pleasure. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Darren, thank you. Cheers, guys. Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in.